and uh, writer on all things South American football, Marcela Mora y Araco is on the line. And uh, good afternoon. Good evening to you, Marcela. Hi, good afternoon. Hello. Last time we chatted to you, you were in Buenos Aires and you're now en route to the World Cup. Where are you? I'm now in Madrid Airport, actually. Super exciting. <laughs> And I've been here quite a few hours, but I'm not going to complain because this is uh, really, really good and fun. I'm hoping to get there for the game tomorrow. Argentina, Netherlands. There's um, Netherlands, Argentina. Not sure which way around. I think it's, it's officially built. Netherlands, Argentina. There's been yeah, uh, I think so. the one really noticeable thing from the uh, the la- the previous game, the Australia game, um, which I haven't noticed with a huge amount of the other countries, but just the sheer number of Argentina fans. Um, it was incredible um, amount of them. The atmosphere was incredible. The noise was incredible. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a it's an expensive thing to get out there, but they're there in their numbers. Yes, I mean it's super expensive to get out there from Argentina, from South America, but a lot of them probably live outside Argentina. Um, anyway in Europe and so on. There's also been uh, well, there's quite a lot of different stories which are all rather lovely but there the after the first game where obviously Saudi Arabia were the majority fans much louder they were locals if, if you like and um much closer there was concerted efforts a to encourage and maybe entice and help Argentinian fans get over there which is common in World Cups generally like the supporters associations club help um Football Association assistance and so on, and also really concerted efforts by the Argentinian fans already out there to sit together and and organise and maybe you know there was kind of nice messaging saying ignore seat numbers let's all go behind the goal and so on, which uh, I think what you can, you can definitely sense you can hear it um, when the group is together as opposed to spread around the stadium. And I think that happens as World Cups go on anyway, because people often buy tickets without particularly knowing which game it's going to be for. And, you know, there's no home and away division at the World Cup stadium by definition. But as the competition progresses, fans look out for each other. And then the other final point about the number of fans is how many people that are not from Argentina are also supporting Argentina, particularly a lot of the Asian community, Indian, Bangladesh, Pakistani, who are numerous on the ground in Qatar. So a a combination of things, plus a lot of maybe other rowdy football-loving folk have gone home. That's just the nature of the of the knockout phase. Yeah, well, what's not to love about supporting Argentina, it must be said. What, uh, is it your expectation that they'll be there for another 10 days, Marcela? It's definitely my wish. I don't know if wish and expectation are the same. There's no a priori reason why it can't be done. I do think the Netherlands are, um, re- you know, really pr- proper difficult uh, adversaries to, to, to beat. But, but you know... Um, it's a little bit of luck and a little bit of determination. I quite like, I quite like Scaloni and his team, his kind of Ima Samuel management team approach. Uh, they're, they're quite connected to this idea that football isn't chess, that it's about feeling and imagination. They like the creatives. I was just listening to Pablo Imar discussing the role of a creative playmaker and how a solid defence can be broken and uh, beaten by the creative player who has the imagination to to look for for spaces that aren't obvious. It's a nice discourse. We have to see it put to the test with the, you know, the super harsh kind of hyper modern, really young, efficient, uh, tactical, um, you know, it, 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 European. Mm exponents but uh i think te- we definitely argentina could be there for another 10 days certainly for another f- three or four even if not i think if the if it's a it's a, if it's an enjoyable game of football if they get to do you know if we get to see a little bit of messi's uh sparkle then 
it's good. It's job done, and there's you know we've we've done really well, and there'll be no recriminations or huge upsets. It's it's quite a long way to have come this, and I think fans are satisfied. With that in mind, then Marcella, the the messy magic, the um, beautifully uh, way you've described about that that creative player in the middle of midfield. What's your expectation of? the truth about this Argentina team because you've alluded to it there we don't really know was it the team that scraped past uh, Australia in the last round or if there's the ceiling is much higher than that Sorry there's a little crackle so I'm just going to uh, guess that you've asked me um, about the What's the ceiling? The te- What's your view uh, of the, the ceiling, the ceiling sorry, of this team? Yeah, G- yeah, give, yeah. Given, the, given what you've spoken about given that let's face it they scraped past Australia um you know, and as you as you alluded to, coming up against a powerhouse um, like the Netherlands, what's your your um, your sense of the ceiling of this Argentina team? No, I think I mean I think it's a kind of uh, strange, you know, hybrid of luck and and prowess. I don't think there is a ceiling particularly, and I don't. I wouldn't say this great past Australia. There was definitely opportunities missed and there was a little bit of luck in opportunities conceded like that, that, that Australia missed. But I I think the general idea of what Argentina is trying to do is is okay and, it, and, and I think the players are up to it. Um, there was, you know, Di Maria on form and uh, Messi on form and Lautaro Martinez fit and on form is is really quite powerful and I, I you know I don't I don't see that there's any reason to think oh they're not up to the standards of of anything of competitive European football of competitive world football or anything like that I think um we've we've had surprises as well I don't think Spain we're we're expecting to to go home it's interesting spending the afternoon here in Spain with a the match against Morocco is being played over and over and over on TV and uh, people you know people who work here in the airport have been um teasing each other obviously some support Morocco and some don't it, it, it's complete fluke in a way I mean personally I I really don't like the penalty shootout definition as a way of, of ending the competition but I think at, during during uh, normal time Argentina could easily do this uh, and by easily I mean just as equally easily as the Netherlands so um, yeah I, I, I'm not expect. I don't think Argentina coming in as underdogs or not up to it or whatever right I'm worried about injuries a little bit and fitness generally and um, yeah, that that's it really. And and Messi enjoying it. My main fear is like a a, a final Messi moment on the international uh, stage that isn't somehow kind of joyful and happy. You know. Um, can, you, can you talk to us about that then a little bit, maybe to expand on just on Messi and his previously slightly awkward relationship with the Argentinian public and at the age of 35 there's this blossoming of something beautiful it seems from the outside looking in between him and uh, his people yeah I think I mean it's interesting I think it's been quite a while now that that his uh, relationship with Argentina has switched and it did seem to start a little bit um, fractiously in a way and it has to do I think with this idea of uh this demand and expectation that people have of how patriotism or nationalism should be expressed by the by the stars in this case the football stars but it could be any athlete or or, or artist and we see it a lot in Argentina I think with Messi it was particularly demanding because he seemed to be thriving in at his club and he had grown up in Barcelona. He was doing incredibly well there. And so it was this kind of added thing. Oh, you can do it for them, but you can't do it for us. Uh, which I think is slightly, well, personally, I think it's very, it's misplaced criticism. It's it's wrong because he actually did do very well with Argentina and for Argentina. He just didn't do that kind of clencher of picking the, 
the cup itself or doing the final, you know, the final score. But mm. with Messi, we got to finals, semi-finals, and did well at, at, in all sorts of competitions. And now that has very much changed. And he seems to be super comfortable in this uh, kind of Argentina emblem symbol and and uh you know even we started talking about how many fans are there and the acknowledgement to them the going up to the bit of the stands where they are and clapping and applauding them first and it it's it, i think it's a really interesting um kind of i would say transformation but maybe it's not transformation it's rather a transition like he's become more comfortable in his Argentinianness, perhaps since leaving Barcelona as well, or uh, perhaps since winning the Copa America, like the, but both things could have an impact. One is the club environment and the idea that he could exist beyond Barcelona and maybe his whole kind of footballing identity was less cinched to that. And the other perhaps just um growing growing into a, a a a winner somebody who can take on leadership and responsibility i mean i've sometimes mentioned it kind of coincided with maradona dying as well but i i don't know how linked that is but it, it's a kind of growing up in which he has lionel messi seems to have embraced this argentinian idol role mm -hmm with much more comfort and the nation itself is is less critical of how he displays this love for Argentina that was demanded of him for so long. There's also probably a generational thing. There's younger people now that have less of a of a kind of burden and a, and a sense of expectation. Um, you know, those of us who grew up with Maradona were kind of in the middle, but those, the kids kids now teenagers they just love Messi and he's the one they've seen win the Coppa get to the World Cup finals in 2014 and now maybe you know uh maybe get to semis so yeah there's less there's less recrimination and more um adoration we'll see how long it lasts because you know football love is fickle yeah is there any part of the Ronaldo implosion, uh, Marcella, that is, uh, he, maybe he's not as petty as the rest of us mere mortals. Is there any part of the uh, Ronaldo implosion that is actually making him uh, grow a bit and, and drive to the, I know he's obviously a couple of years younger, but drive to the end line in a more determined, inclusive, productive way? Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I've always thought the Ronaldo Messi uh kind of rivalry was 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 hyped up by the media much more than genuinely a, a real thing that exists um i was kind of it's it was fascinating watching the ronaldo implosion as you call it which it, there was also a lot of love for him at, at the stadium and he did mm. and acknowledge that so it wasn't a complete tantrum or a kind of paralyzing uh meltdown you know like the, like we've seen in um, the, say the other Ronaldo uh, in the final, or or even Zidane. I mean, we've we've seen great. We've had enormous expectations for legends that have then got to the World Cup stage and either for one reason or another just gone in a different direction to what we were expecting. The Ronaldo implosion was basically uh, a moment in time where it was just obvious that. It could be done without him. It must be very difficult for him. But it was a fantastic result for the team. I think I, I would be incredibly surprised if Argentina did anything similar to that. But I doubt very much that Messi will derive any pleasure or satisfaction or strength from what happened to Ronaldo because I suspect he uh, has 100% of understanding and empathy for that position, which is to be in your mid-30s and see you know youth coming coming up i mean e even within the argentina squad the the really young kids that have never experienced the world cup before are the ones that are have been reliable and you know we're all like going oh my god yes 
Hang on in there. Mm. McAllister and um, Enzo Fernandez, Julian Alvarez. So, you know, I, I doubt Messi would be reassured or grimacing with kind of evil satisfaction that Cristiano Ronaldo had to sit and watch uh, such a such a fantastic game. Because I'm sure if you're like on the bench for that, you think, oh, I wish I was in there. But I doubt um, it's not something all legends kind of have to face at some point in their career. And it's just very odd when they implode on the on the on the world stage, but it shouldn't really make us think any less of them. Yeah, that's fair, fair point, and well, uh, well communicated. The the um, you mentioned just about the the younger profile, almost of the Argentina team, and it, certainly for the neutrals looking in, um, and I'm sure some of those supplanted Ar- Argentinians, as you mentioned in the uh, in the stadia in Qatar, um, would wish and hope, and uh, if you're religious, pray for an Argentina Brazil semi final. It's a, a thing World Cups are made for. Is it going to happen? Well. <sighs> I don't know. Um, yes, I think. I mean, I think some, possibly the neutrals have more uh, excitement for a really hard match than 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 the fans of each country. I think, um, you know, England France feels like a, a delicious encounter to watch without without one's heart uh, in it. You know, when you don't really mind who wins, but. Um, I think, yeah, facing Brazil would be a classic, a super derby, if you like. It would get a lot of emotions uh, running quite high and it would be, uh, in a way, revenge for the final of the uh, Copa America. But at the same time, there's a lot of respect and there's a kind of, you know, with the, the, the kind of metaphoric talk is uh, siblings, you know, siblings understanding and there's some kind of pride if if both Argentina and Brazil get to uh, a late stage and that's the that's the continent represented um you, you know in the same way I think that a lot of the African and Arab nations are super proud of Morocco I think that uh, the last World Cup did slightly become a kind of glorified Euro Cup Mm. Early, early on, and and so there, it would be amazing, you know, if Argentina and Brazil, not exactly underdogs in the football world stage, but they would get, they would garner the the support and the relish of a whole whole area of the world, thinking, yeah, we haven't lost our mojo, there we are. Yeah. But uh, there's probably quite a lot of people who'd rather an easier rival. Um, speaking of Mojo, the uh, the dancing Brazilians obviously has uh, sparked a bit of a, 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 I don't know, storm seems like I'm, I'm overstating it. Having overstated other things in this uh, chat up to now, I won't go that far, but uh, certainly caused a bit of a ripple of reaction from certain quarters. What is your sense of, have you paid much of attention of uh, how that's gone down in Brazil about the celebrations post-goal, again, goals against uh, Korea? No, I wasn't aware that there was a that there was a. Um, I mean, I know I know a particular character uh, said he didn't like it, and a lot of, and then there was some kind of media response to him in Brazil saying, "Oh, you Europeans, you know, you can't you can't bear that we uh, do things differently elsewhere in the world." But I I think um, I mean, how could you not dance or celebrate or be happy? Come on, that's just. Silly, I, I'm, you know, I, but uh, I don't know. The, yeah. There's rules about how one should celebrate, and there's, you know, the people are fined for taking their shirt off or running too much or jumping into the crowds. This seemed very lovely and kind of fun, and they even got Tite doing it, which is, I, I think, if you have a golf fest, you're allowed to fest, mm. fest around it however you like. But I have to say, I haven't really been following the. I wonder if there's there's a point because suddenly mid this week I started seeing a lot of very personal attacks on specific pundits and journalists from different quarters, even the Argentinian press, uh, saying this guy is not doing his job right. And I wonder if it's a kind of point mid tournament where you have to go well, 
we've talked about these issues, we've talked about these issues, we've talked about these, and now we're going to like just say who who we like and we don't like mm. in in the commentary. But I think, yeah, I think um, you know it's it's a it's a smallish thing. I don't, I don't think it's a big deal in Brazil whether someone thinks they should dance or not dance. Good <laughs> uh, celebrating a goal. That's uh, that's what World Cups are all about. There's a real joylessness, I think, to uh, suggesting otherwise. Marcela, safe uh, safe travelling on. Thanks a million. Thank you. Thank you so much.